Buenas, estamos aqui com mais um UJL Cast. Eu sou o Paulo e estou fazendo aqui minha primeira aparição porque hoje a gente vai começar o nosso quadro sobre trajetórias profissionais. Estamos aqui com um convidado muito especial. Ele é Odros Piliópolis, na verdade ele é canadense, ele é um químico, físico, neurologista e artista plástico canadense. Ele tomou um tempinho para falar com a gente. Então, evidentemente, o episódio vai ser totalmente em inglês. Se tu tá vendo pelo Spotify, sinta-se à vontade para ver alguns dos nossos outros episódios. Se não, segura aí um pouquinho que daqui a pouco mais o episódio vai pro YouTube legendado para vocês. Uh, so, now I'm going to switch to English. Uh, Audrius, uh, I would like to thank you again for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to hear you. Uh, so, to start with, Who is Audrius Leopis? Well, um, <laughs> that's an interesting question to ask <laughs> to begin with. The, um, uh, I, I've had a, a sort of two professional careers in my life, but we're going to stick on professional things. Who I am as a human being uh, in a very simple fashion who tries to do the best he can. So I, I'm still trying. I'm still trying to learn along the way how, how to do this, uh, with, with having made a lot, of, a lot of errors along the way. I continue to make these errors and uh, 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 trying to improve myself. The, um, uh, the, the two careers I've had uh, simultaneously are neurology, neurobiology, and art. And um, the, the, the kind of general picture of my history uh, is that I was born and raised in Toronto, Canada. And um, a friend of mine, Uh, he was about two years older than I, was a real uh, juvenile delinquent. He would get into lots of trouble. And, uh, for example, at the age of 14, he already had a motorcycle. Well, that, that was illegal at that time. You, know, you only have it when you're 18, as, as now. But, but he managed, I don't know where he got the money from, I don't know how he did it. He, but he took, it was fun, you know, hanging around with him and driving around the streets of Toronto on his motorcycle. But, but he was really a, a, a rather hardcore delinquent. One summer, his parents um, uh, decided to uh, keep the streets of Toronto safe by putting him into an art school. And so, uh, and so during the summer, when I would go over to visit with him almost daily, I'd see him start working on a white canvas, just a white piece of, uh, of canvas. And then there were lines, black lines, and then colors started to appear. And before you know it, you have a beautiful uh, forest scene with trees and, and animals and things. And I couldn't believe it. How is it possible, you know, to start from nothing and create something beautiful? I was 10 years old around uh, at, at that time. And uh, that, 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 that was the seed for art. And it was in my heart all along. And it only started growing when I was in medical school. I was at the University of Chicago. I went to college then I went to medical school. The, uh, and, and the reason I went to medicine uh, was very specifically to try and understand how the mind works, how the brain works. Uh, I, I was in a biology course there um, where the teacher uh, was a very vibrant, exciting person uh, who, uh, who, when he talked about the nervous system, it became just fascinating to me. You know, you know we have 100 billion neurons up here, cells in our, in our, in our brains up here. Our livers are bigger in size, more cells are there, but our livers don't produce us as human beings. This up here does. How does that happen? How, how, how does it occur that thought arises, consciousness, awareness of others? And then once you, once you are aware of yourself and aware of others, then you have society form and then you have civilization. How does that happen? So that, that was fast. That question was really fascinating to me. So that drove me to into neurology, neurobiology, neurobiology research, and into medicine. And at that time, I decided that I had a choice of going into either basic neurobiology and going for a PhD degree or going the harder, longer route through medicine to get an MD degree and specialize in neurology. And I decided to go the harder, longer route because I could have access then to patients, see patients and take care of them too. Besides, and also do laboratory research also. So you can do, if you go the MD route, you can do both. 
basic laboratory research, which I did. I had lots of mice and rat colonies and all of those kind of things too over the years. So I, I did have an animal, a lot of animal research I did too, but I also had access to patients and patient material. And I was able to contribute to the care of individuals on a one-to-one -one basis. And also some of the things that I did uh, have still had to con continue to have some benefit to people with neurologic uh, problems and neurologic illnesses. So the um, uh, uh, so I decided to go that route. And while I was in medical school is when the, the alternate world started to grow in me. And I started spending more and more time uh, uh, painting, uh, 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 visiting art galleries, going to art museums, going to art lectures. And as, as time went on, I would spend more and more time doing that. And, and at the time I finished medical school, I was really in a, in a crisis situation. I had thought that, well, maybe I had made a mistake. Maybe I should not have gone into medicine. I should have gone into art. But that really was my calling in life. Well, friends of mine convinced me to, um, uh, to at least finish my internship. So I went to the University of Wisconsin hospitals in Madison, Wisconsin for a year to do my internship. And I lived like a church mouse very, very cheaply. Very, 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 very simple accommodation. Saved every penny that I could. My salary that year was $10,000. Uh, and I saved every penny that I could of that money. And then quit medicine entirely. Took off to the East Coast, set up a studio, a very modest studio in a basement and a small room and, and did my art. And, and, and it was successful. I had art exhibits and even in the first year had a had a uh, exhibit in, in the uh, what was then called the National Collection of Fine Arts. Now it's the American Museum of Art, one of the Smithsonian museums. So even had a museum exhibit in my first year uh, and individual exhibits and sales started to take place and a lot of write-ups about my art. So everything started off very well, but then uh, I started to feel very guilty that I had all this knowledge of neurology and I wasn't doing anything to help anybody. I was just, you know, enjoying life myself, doing what I want to do. And I thought that then I realized that then it dawned on me that I had made an error. And the error was a fundamental error. And the error was that I don't need to choose one or the other, art or medicine. I don't have to do that. I'm smart. Okay. I have a University of Chicago degree that proves I'm smart. And with my smart brain, I should be able to figure out how to put these things together. So that's when I realized I can go back to medicine, go back to neurology, take care of patients, and also do art. But the art had to change. I had to stop going doing conceptual work and go into something different. And so the, uh, the theme of my art has been, for the, for the past more than 30 years, where thinking comes from, where consciousness, so that my art looked at the same questions as my clinical work did, and my research work did so that it would be all cohesive and together. So, so, so that that's what I decided to do. <coughs> when I contacted my acquaintances at the Mayo Clinic, they accepted me to go, come back into neurology, and then child neurology at the hospital for sick children, and then research in at Laval University in Quebec City, back in Toronto for three years doing research and uh, being a child neurologist, and then thirty years in Chicago running Alzheimer's disease programs, uh, clinics, research, uh, and, and, and an awful lot of work uh, uh, in the world of cerebral palsy and children with severe cerebral palsy, taking care of them on the clinical world and always doing my art and having lots of art exhibits. Now, in terms of a, a summary of everything that's happened, uh, just very briefly, I think it's approximately 75 research publications I've authored. I received almost not quite three million dollars in grant support for my research uh, over the years, adding it all up. So, so that's been very successful. The um, uh, in that end of things, um, it, it, some of the contributions that I've made to the care of individuals are now standard therapy uh, in hospital children's hospitals across North America uh, that you'll find everywhere, and you see people in, even at home. Uh, with children with severe cerebral palsy are using some of the apparatuses that I uh, uh, applied to prevent pneumonia as a children with severe cerebral palsy. So that's in use. 
And so that, that, that's very satisfying. And in terms of art, I, I've had more than 50 individual art exhibits, or more than 100 group shows. I have projects. Now, uh, somehow things migrated from, from the United States into, into Lithuania. And I just have a whole ton of projects out there right now ongoing. And, and I already had a, a slew of exhibits this fall uh, uh, in, uh, in Lithuania, about five, six or seven individual different exhibits. And now next uh, uh, June is going to be a ton of other programs and large scale outdoor installations so that, that the art is, is blossoming too, but, but sort of in, a, in another geographic location outside of Chicago. So, 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 so that, that's, you asked me, what am I? So I answered it. I'm, I'm a human being who tries to do something and hopefully, well, and hopefully cause a lot of trouble along the way. Um, I believe you already answered many of the, the questions I was going to ask, but um, going back to the beginning, how was you uh, as a student? I mean, during high school, did you already knew that you wanted to work with science? Uh, what, what, what the science end of things was uh, kind of what was interesting. The when I was growing up in Toronto, the um, it, whenever anybody asked me, uh, you know, my parents, friends of my parents would ask, what are you going to do when you grow up? It was either cowboy or policeman, you know, one or the other. Very simple answer, you know, cowboy or policeman, because that's what you, you know, kind of <laughs> uh, uh, a rote answer. The, when I, then our family moved from Canada to the United States, and I was in seventh grade, and there was uh, one of the classes we took, it was a junior high school, in seventh grade, the um, a very very interesting science teacher, and, and, and he and he just had the talent to explain science and and show the at least to me presented it in a very very interesting fashion. He did a lot of demonstrations. It wasn't simply chalkboard or or real talk. It was actually doing things, simple, simple kinds of things, but uh, that, uh, uh, but, but, but it's kind of simple experiments that he do and illustrate it. And it was very intellectually extremely sad, interesting to me. And that's when the concept of to become a scientist showed up in my mind. And, 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 that's, and that's it. And then that was in seventh grade. And that desire for science went through all of high school. And so that when I went, applied to the university i was living in chicago then and applied to colleges there was only one school i wanted to go to uh you know for for, for financial reasons our family was fairly poor uh, i couldn't I couldn't afford the idea of, of a room and board to be something local and the only university that was you know, had some really serious standing in physics was the university of chicago so that's why i applied there and was accepted with a full scholarship, and I didn't apply to anybody else. It'd be just at one school, and that's it, you know. And, 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 and so that's how I ended up at the University of Chicago to study physics. And, and with the idea at that time, um, atomic physics was extremely exciting. New particles were being described almost every week. The concept of quarks had just come out. People just started talking about quarks which are now, you know, proven uh, uh, things that they exist. It was a very, very exciting time in physics. And, and so that, 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 that ended up there uh, in terms of, so that, that's how the science ended up in my life. And I still am fascinated with, with basic scientific issues. I subscribe to scientific, my entire life, Scientific American. I read it, follow it. On, on, uh, in the evenings, I like uh, looking at uh, YouTube videos as opposed to television and an awful lot of uh, science YouTube uh, 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 programs are on that I keep following on a regular basis. So, so, so I keep up with, with that end of it. Now, in terms of teachers having a big, you know, this was one teacher, I don't remember his name at all. He was in seventh grade and uh, unfortunately, I, I can't possibly remember his name. But a similar kind of thing happened when I was in, in college and how I ended up doing the biology course. Uh, I wanted to do physics, understand what matter is made out of, what everything is, 
uh, what, what atoms are, what all the subatomic particles are, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and everything from all the first year. And then the second year curriculum came out, and I had to take two semesters of biology. And I couldn't understand why biology. What why what 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 does toads or blood have anything to do with physics? You know, I, I couldn't understand it. I went to my counselor, the, my advisor. He was the chairman of the department of chemistry. So I sat down with him and I said, "Look, this is ridiculous. I don't want to do this biology. It's a waste of my time. You know, I I, I have broad interests. You know, I'll, I'll study Greek language. I'll I'll do Aristotle, Plato, anything." But but not 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 this, and, and he said to me, well you know, okay I I can do that, but there's a little problem. The problem is that after four years of college you won't get a degree. And so and so I says oh, oh there's a problem. <laughs> so I went and I says I was very unhappy. So I went into class the first day very unhappy biology class. And guess who it was there? It was Richard Mintel. That's the name of this teacher. He had recently graduated himself, University of Chicago, and he was incredibly entertaining, incredibly uh, a dynamic person. Sometimes he even stand on top of the table, talking you know, at the top of his voice. He was so energetic uh, a person, and that's the guy who, when he started talking about the brain and how these neurons start to work, that, that that's what fascinated me and made me go into neurology. So, so that it was, so that it was another science teacher who had a great big impact on my life. So we have, in my own personal life, two examples happened where teachers had a tremendous impact on what I decided to do. So the role of education in my life was was was, was really, you know, pivotal, pivotal in two different areas. And I think that's your answer to your question. I believe you find the answer how you ended up in neurology, but you went to the University of Chicago to study physics, and you somehow ended up also majoring chemistry. How was that? Is that a, um, some sort of common thing in the United States? In chemistry? Uh, uh, you, you asked me about chemistry? Yeah, you major both physics and chemistry. oh yeah that's right what, what, what happened is this is that is that what uh, um, the you see the the curriculum for a, a degree in college degree is four years four years that you need to study and it was during the second year that I took biology and I became fascinated with the uh, nervous system so by the time I finished my second year I realized, wait a minute, I really need to go in, I, I need to shift out of physics and into a, some either neurobiology or into medicine. And what happened was that when I decided to, 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 go, to go the medicine route, I started schools and their, their uh, requirements for um, a, a, a entrance and uh, uh, what, what you need to take. And I needed to take a lot more chemistry courses that was required plus more biology courses so that what I did is in my third year uh, added a lot of chemistry and, and biology so that's where the chemistry uh, major shows up also because because of that requirement now just just incidental the uh, the, uh, the additional chemistry that I did was physical chemistry uh, not just regular but physical a, a, a area that kind of is a kind of in between chemistry and physics and I did extremely well. The, um, the, 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 um, at the end of the year, the, 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 the teacher of physical chemistry uh, approached me and he offered me to start right away in a PhD program of physical chemistry at the University of Chicago with all tuition paid with and with a stipend to cover all of my expenses, room and board and everything. And I told him, I'm sorry, but I'm going to medical school. I've already been accepted. So, so I, I, I turned down that. So I was offered. So I did that well in physical chemistry to be offered, uh, uh, you know, that entire professional door open, all expense paid uh, education uh, in that. But I sort of turned it down because of medical school. Oh, and the other thing is this. 
is I left college after my third year. So that quite technically I'm a college dropout. I never finished college. I dropped out and went to medical school. <laughs> so, so me and Bill Gates have something in common. <laughs> and uh, have you ever worked with it? I mean, have you ever worked with physics and research or something like that? Did I work in physics myself? Well, yeah, I just studied it. And, and, uh, and I still keep studying it and learning about it even now. But in terms of working, no, I didn't, you know, the laboratory experiments I did in college, yes, but, but outside of that, no, I haven't done any kind of physics type work. But I've incorporated in some of my artwork series of issues related to basic physics, yes. Um, you also have a vast research into neurology. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I believe you started researching into autism, kids with autism, um, and then you w went to Alzheimer's disease, and then you ended up kind of researching and studying kids with cerebral palsy. Um, how was that? Can you tell us uh, something, a little bit, just uh, the basic maybe, about um, each one of them? Yeah, well, what, what, what happened was I was in the, uh, uh, the, the there's a linkage between between these kind of things, how it happened, uh, although it sounds like it covers a, a, a wide battery of different areas, there, there is a linkage here. Now, the, uh, the phenomenon of autism uh, has always been very interesting to me as it is to other people. You have, you have people who have, you know, a, a rather... Uh, severe social uh, difficulties and problems, uh, particularly plus other neurologic deficits can take place. And the thing about autism that interested me the most, the specific aspect of it, is that maybe, I forget the number, maybe about one third of autistic children are normal uh, until a certain time in development. And then they lose abilities, lose their social abilities and degenerate and, and, and become autistic. Other ones, there's something from birth, something strange, and that they, they've always been unusual and having problems. But there is that population, maybe a third of them, where, that look entirely normal, and then they deteriorate. So my question was, well, what causes this deterioration? Where does it come from? And my idea was, maybe it, there's an immunologic explanation. Maybe there's an autoimmune disease that takes place that causes it. And those selected, now not everyone with autism, and not in all of those that regress, but in some of them, it may be an autoimmune disease. If it is an autoimmune disease, then we can treat it. There are treatments available for autoimmune disorders, and maybe you can make it under control. So that, that was the, a lot of my research went into this particular question. And as far as I'm concerned, that question has not been fully. Now that work I did, we're talking about um, a, a lot of very important studies that I did. Now is going to be 30 years ago, or approximately. Very important studies that I've done and published that have been basically ignored, that has not been picked up on. And I just was not anymore in a situation where I was able to continue that work myself. But I, my idea was if you publish it, get it out there, somebody would notice it and continue it. But, they, but that has not happened. And, 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 and some weird professional politics is in part in play here, like everywhere in the world. And uh, I, I don't want to, well, that would be a separate podcast, my complaining about the politics in medicine and how just horrible it is. Anyway, but especially with this recent, recent pandemic. But I don't, I don't want to get into it because I'll go for four hours just about that. We, we, and we don't want that kind of the, the, uh, digression. The, um, but, 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 uh, but, but there is, but, but that definitely does, but my opinion, it does take place. It hasn't been sorted out at all. People haven't been looking at it further. But that's an area, I think, of where that would be productive. And I do know from personal experience, there was a child that I was able to start treating as early in life after the autistic regression started. I treated that child with intravenous immunoglobulin. 
uh, a rather safe treatment for autoimmune disorders, that child over time during the treatment normalized entirely. There was a tragedy in the family. A serious car accident happened. The father died. They lost all of their uh, 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 finances. They lost uh, their medical insurance. Uh, they couldn't, you know, they're barely be able to then, without my mother was not able to come to me and, and, and had no way to pay for the for further immunoglobulin therapy. And this child then gradually reverted back into autism. So this was a case where the child was cured, but then because we could not continue the therapy further, it was expensive and, and the child regressed. But so that that is a real phenomenon. It does happen. I, I saw it myself. I produced it. But and it's worthy of continuing now. Now the, the so that, that that that's just the one kind of key aspect of of, of the autism world. Now in in terms of uh, uh, research laboratory work, I used neuroimmunologic techniques to study the developing brain, uh, brain development. So that the child neurology deals with how does the brain develop and how does it form and and do problems occur and how, and how to intervene in that. And the kinds of things that I was actually ended up looking at and the biochemical pathways in my research laboratory that I was looking at uh, in Toronto, I realized that this, these, these pathways can, have a, a, can be part of the same pathways that appear in Alzheimer's disease. And, and, and that Alzheimer's, some aspects of Alzheimer's disease may be due to problems in his developmental uh, uh, genetic pathways, developmental neurobiologic pathways. So I wanted to study this thing further. And I had research grants and, uh, for in Toronto to do this. And, well, in terms of the developmental neurobiology, uh, the basic laboratory type stuff. What I wanted to do was to expand from from child neurology and, and, and animal work and, and to incorporate material from Alzheimer's patients and, and, and get involved into more and more directed Alzheimer's work. Now, the, the problem happened uh, is I visited a large number of, of people doing research in Alzheimer's disease and other adult neurology problems. Everybody said my ideas were wonderful, my ideas were great, ta -da, ta -da, but nothing nothing happened. There was no collaboration. People were polite, but nothing occurred from this politeness. And it took me a while, it took me about a year to realize what the problem was. And the problem was very simple. I'm a child neurologist. I, I have a label. And in this traditional world of British medicine, I have no business in adult neurology. That's Alzheimer's disease. So, so there, there, there was going to be, people will be polite, but they won't tell you anything, that they won't work with you. So that was the issue. So it was, so I couldn't go anywhere. I realized it's impossible. So then the issue was, do I stay in Canada and continue, which I was what I was doing, or do I figure out a way to do the Alzheimer's work? Well, the only way for me to do the Alzheimer's work was to leave Canada and move to the United States. So I did. I thought that this was a possibility of, of a major breakthrough in Alzheimer's research, and I didn't want to lose this possibility. So I moved to the United States, set up a research laboratory, uh, was invited, and, and I ran a research lab, and we set up clinical programs, and that ran for a few years. It turned out that my hypothesis was not correct. It did not produce a, a breakthrough in Alzheimer's research, but it was worth pursuing as, a, as something worth doing. So, so I was very sad, happy about that and uh, uh, that I did that. So that's why I ended up back in the United States and Alzheimer's. So that's how the linkage from autism to immunology research techniques into Alzheimer's work all connected up. You know, the cerebral palsy was a very different, unexpected thing. There was a child neurologist in Chicago who was retiring who asked me to take over his clinical practice. And he took care of a couple of centers of children with a very severe cerebral palsy. And he wanted somebody to take, to take be responsible, take over it. And, 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 and so that's how I ended up in that world. Uh, and it's sort of uh, unexpectedly. And since I was now in charge, I, I was going to do the best job possible. 
and, and I think I did and, and for more than 20 years, um, uh, provided care to these very severely disabled children and made some clinical progress, which I'm proud of in their care. So that's, and then that was just an unexpected development. It just, just happened. At a, and it happened at a time when I was actually looking for some ways to expand my uh, uh, my clinical earnings at that time. And um, you also worked in a number of universities as an assistant professor. Um, your work was more focused on research, or did you also lecture to you know, give classes to students? Um, how was that? How was uh, your work? In your well, the, 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 uh, uh, the work both at, at you know, I had a position at, your, at Professor University of Toronto when I was there, and I, and I sort of covered the work that I was doing. There wasn't anything additional other than other than my work, clinical work at the Hospital for Sick Children, which is part of the university, uh, my teaching to residents and interns uh, on wards, and doing the research that I did. And that basically was the same thing here in Chicago at the University of Illinois. So that uh, what I, you know, is just that the additional thing I mentioned is that uh, in the hospital, seeing patients that were residents and, and interns there, that I would sort of explain things to teach them too at the same time. But there wasn't anything really else that I did at the universities. And um, what should you say are the best and the worst parts of working with neurology, both in terms of research and in clinical practice? Well, the, uh, the, 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 the I, I think in terms of, you know, what's good, about it is that if you're in an area where you you feel a calling for what you're doing okay and if you're doing that which you feel is what you're meant to do so that, that, that that's got nothing to do with medicine or anything that that's a matter of does the work you're doing fit you as an individual as a human being and in my case everything I did fit and I made sure it would fit because if it didn't fit I wouldn't do it simple as that and, 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 and there were situations in my career along the way where things did not go well and and, and, the, and the employment situation well, was not like for example I explained to you I wanted to do the Alzheimer's work in Toronto couldn't well the only way to do it is to leave Canada and so I did so I changed the entire environment moved to the United States and, and, and so so that uh, so that I, I pursued the things that were important to me and, and, and both in the world of clinical medicine and, and in the world of, of uh, neurobiology research that were important to me. And I did those and I made those decisions at the time and I did them and, I, and I'm very satisfied with how things worked out uh, personally. The, um, the, but this doesn't have to be specific about, about these areas. This is just me doing what I think I needed to do. Same thing with art. I needed to do that, and I did that. Now, in terms of the, the bad side, there is one really very, very bad side, which I could not get used to, and I still have not been, not been able to get used to it. And that's the change that took place in the United States with the medicine, uh, and which had a big impact, which was not there when I started medicine. The, the, this was not there when I went to medical school. It wasn't an issue. It didn't exist. It wasn't there. And... and and it really didn't exist when I was at the Mayo Clinic doing my neurology residency. It wasn't an issue. And it didn't really exist in, in Canada when I was working. But during that time, it evolved in the United States. And when I came back to the United States, boom, there it is. Medical malpractice, lawsuits against doctors. That is something which I had totally not, was not... Uh, accustomed to this concept and idea. And then uh, for 30 years in the United States working, the, you realize there's always the threat of lawsuits against you when you're doing medical care. You're being sued, and it can be sued for, for nonsensical, idiotic reasons just to make money. And, 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 the, and the ramifications of it are gigantic, have been gigantic. And, and, and as a provider in the medical, I've always provided medical care 
sensibly, conscientiously, as a good doctor, as a responsible person. Doing unnecessary tests is a very bad idea. If you don't need to do a brain scan, don't do it. Okay? There's no reason for it. If you don't really, if you do need it, you need, you do it. But you don't need it, you don't. Just because somebody wants it, you don't do it. That's the way I always did it for 30 years. Okay? Sometimes when you do brain scans for no reason, you come up with findings that mean nothing really, but then they operate. And then and I've had cases where that's happened. People have died for no reason because of total stupidity of idiot doctors trying to doing stupid things uh, irresponsibly. And, 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 and what that, and in a practical sense, in the United States, I'm convinced at least one third of all the medical care costs in this country are wasted, wasted money, doctors doing things to prevent lawsuits, doing lousy medical care, running up costs tremendously to prevent lawsuits, at least one third of, of the cost. So the, and this threat, and basically every single time I would see a patient, is this, you, you walk out, you're wondering, well, will they sue me one day or won't they? This is terrible, that this is not a world that I grew up in. Now, if I had started medicine in this world and you got used to it, but no. See, I came up from the days when lawsuits didn't exist. Doctors were respected. People didn't sue them. And, and it was at the Mayo Clinic, the same thing. In Canada, you wouldn't sue doctors ever. But the, when I moved back here, then it had already evolved into this kind of thing. So this, this is a very, very bad thing in my life. I think that currently people are going to medical school, learning the training. They're used to it as an issue doesn't bother them. But for me, it, 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 I just could never get used to it over the years, over the decades, and it was terrible. And it still is a terrible thing. The concept maybe of going back into medical care is appealing to me. I'd like to be able to provide some medical care to patients. But when I think about the lawsuit issue, I forget it. Don't, don't want to deal with it. Oh, well, for the next questions, we would be talking a little bit about your uh, art career. The first question, I believe you already kind of answered. Uh, I was going to ask you how this interest in art, in art develop? Was it like a, a, something you developed as a kid or uh, was late later in life? Uh, again, you already kind of answered that. So uh, if you want to tell us something more, include some more, uh, you can, if not, please, so you can go to the next question. Well, in terms of, you know, I already explained, it was that uh, friend of mine, Alex Chasekas in Toronto, with his motorcycle and, 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 uh, and the, uh, you know, the thing about, uh, uh, um, you know, being put into an art school that one summer and, and that being the seed for art, desire for art in my life, where it came from. Now, his, uh, um, and that seed started to grow when I was in medical school. I don't know why, it, it just it just did. Um, just, just as an aside, I still was a good medical student. And uh, even though spending more and more time uh, doing art progressively during medical school, I still did very well in medical school. When I finished, there were these standardized tests that you had to take at the end of the fourth year across the nationwide tests in medicine, and I scored the 85th percentile. That means that only 15% of medical students in their fourth year knew more than I did. And, and that's despite me spending tons of time in art already, doing art anyway. But that, that's, just, that's just an aside. The, um, um, now, the, the one thing that was of interest to me, and, and this just came up recently in a discussion I had with, a, with now a colleague of mine in Lithuania, a musician, uh, who's really of note. Uh, we're working on a collaborative musical music uh, account. Others? Uh, I believe you had a little technical problem here. Uh, we should come back in a couple seconds. We we'll had a problem with the connection here. But, sorry about that, but uh, what can we do? Uh, uh, I set up interviews uh, for internships in different cities across North America, northern United States, and going from uh, Austin, uh, I set up these interviews 
uh, for, for possible internships and visitors. Now, there was a dual, dual purpose to it because I also wanted to visit in each of these cities the primary art school because I thought that when I leave medicine, I should go to art school. That I thought that made sense because, uh, you know, after all, I went to medicine, I went to school, medical school. I didn't simply read a book and declare myself a doctor and went to medical school. So I figured, well, to be an artist, you need to be go to art. And I was already then interested in conceptual art and uh, aspects of what was happening in the contemporary art world. What happened is uh, every single school I went to, now I didn't make appointments, I just walked in off the street. I had the appointments for the internship, but just walked in off the street and walked in and walked into the studios. And what, what are they doing? What are the students being taught to do? And to me, it was shocking. Doesn't matter what, what East Coast, West Coast, Center of United, Canada, the United States, it was all the same. It was abstract expressionist painting. The same thing everywhere was being done. And I had no interest in abstract expressionist painting, none. It was already, at that time, it was already old, as far as I was concerned, old stuff. And you had old professors teaching what they learned as old stuff, uninteresting, where's the conceptual art? And, and I realized to go to art school would be a total waste of time and money. So I, I didn't go to art school. I just did everything on my own in the world of art. And I've been, you know, fairly successful in it, you know, but, uh, but, but not, not stellar in the world of art. And the reason is this is because in the world of art, I am all have been always will be an outsider. I'm not educated in the world of art. I don't have those credentials and I don't have those connections within the world of art. So it limits me in terms of things that I can do and approach. There's always going to be these people that say, well, he's not educated. So therefore he doesn't know what he's doing, even though I do know what I'm doing better than they do. And, and, uh, and, my, and my art is better than theirs. It doesn't matter. You know, they, they, they just look at some of the stuff um, on, on the paperwork. And, and, but so that gives me the freedom to do what I want to do. I'm not constrained, and I've been able to do that my entire life and be successful at it. But there's limits, there's downsides. Everything has got good sides, everything has bad sides. Too. So that, so that, that, that's the sort of downside, downside to it. Now, the, the I mentioned this uh, co composer in Lithuania that just started a collaborative project with him. He's a person of note in Europe, and he's organizing a major international music conference in South Africa next year. And, and so this is going to be a composition where I do the visual elements and he's doing the sound elements on it. It's going to be a, like a 12, 15 minute production. That's the primary uh, piece of the entire conference, international conference. And he, 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 he's in the same situation. The sound, I, mean, I met with him just about uh, two months ago uh, and, and had a chance to talk to him about a month ago. Um, the, the, uh, he also had the same thing. He went to uh, music schools and realized that what everyone was teaching was not what he was interested in. And why, why learn stuff that you don't even want to know? It's a waste of time. So he went on his own, set up his own, but he's always been sort of an outsider too. So in some parts of the world of music, he's accepted as a star, but in a lot of parts of it, he's just, oh, he's not educated, you know? <laughs> so so it's, it's sort of a funny so, so, so we're, we have that in common. So it's not just me, it's other people too. Um, I believe you already answered many of the questions I was going to ask you, uh, specifically about your art career. Uh, you already told us a little bit about uh, the transition between your career in medicine and your career in art. Um, and you already run us through some of the worst and best parts of working with art. So. Uh, going to the next question, what should you say uh, is the essential aspect of an original Cleopolis? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Can you repeat the question? I didn't understand it. Um, I mean, what is the original, most original aspect of your art? How can we differentiate between uh, your art and any other art out there? Well, I, I, I don't know. Every Every piece I make, every piece I do uh, is different and is original in its own route. Every series is. And so, and every, every single work that I do has many, many layers 
of, of elements included in the conceptual layers and visual layers included in it. So every single one is different. Every single project, so every, every single series is different. And, but they all incorporate many, many layers of, of, of content to them. And that's done very purposefully. You know, it's not simply to make a pretty picture that you can hang on the wall and look, oh, this is pretty. No, no, no. I, I, I want my art to be visually engaging so people like to look at it, yes. But it's also got to have a lot of substance to it, too. And, and I'm doing these pieces of art in a fashion similar to how our minds work. When, whenever we, our minds work, we're, we just say, uh, experience new, and a, a, a new thing happens that we enjoy, that we will remember then. Uh, but that's always in the framework of previous experiences, previous memories. We mix them together with previous events that have taken place in our lives and evaluated and stored away in memory stores related to other areas that, of things that have happened before. So it's a complexity that, that overlaps in our own minds and our own brains. And I try and do that in my own artwork so that um, so every single thing I'm doing is, is different and it's in, in this creative and it's sort of unique in its own fashion, but it's also old. Every single thing I do is old because I'm using previous elements that I've used before. I'm made, modifying them, changing them, transforming them. Just like everything, we, you, we use these same old neurons in our heads to, for, for new memories, new ideas, new concepts, and, and, but, but they're still old underlying uh, uh, things that are taking place part part of it too, so that is, it's, it's, it's an ongoing process of, of 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 evolution as things are taking place. Right now, I have two to totally different big giant projects on ongoing. One of which is an outdoor installation of two hundred boulders near a sacred mound in Lithuania. Outdoor installation that's going to be painted this summer. So that's a gigantic project. Uh, dealing with ancient Lithuanian history, burial rites, archaeology, and, and incorporating, you know, uh, uh, families living in the vicinity. So it's a, it's, it's a very, very complex uh, and, and a very, very time-consuming big project that I hope to be able to realize it, make it make progress. It's going to take a number of years to get this accomplished fully. It's not going to get done this summer. We already worked this past summer. We're getting some half the boulders out there. But we're going to be working on and trying to get this accomplished during the summer. That's one totally different project. The other thing is silk scarves, wraps, large scale silk scarves that have been in, in fashion shows and, and have been demonstrated and, and, and are very popular. Uh, and so, a totally different media, a totally different way of presenting my art in a very functional capacity, totally different. It's not, it's, it's not boulders out in a field next to some sacred ancient mound. But it's something that's wearable and usable and beautiful also at the same time. But it still has all of the visual substance to it in, of all my artwork. So, so, that, so those are the two current big projects. Uh, and, and today I was just talking to people about another third one to start up. Uh, so that you know, my, my projects, uh, so it, it's a big, it's, it's a big uh, thing in evolution. Things are changing and modifying and growing. And I don't know where it's going to end up. But in terms of uh, originality, everything's original, everything is good. And if along the way something I don't like it, you won't see it because it, it will be destroyed. It won't exist. What was that? Sorry. <laughs> Bad stuff I throw out. No reason to keep it. There's too much good stuff. <laughs> and uh, where can we, uh, the Brazilians who are watching you, um, find more information about your artwork? Well, on my website. You can see my last name, Pleopolis.com, uh, particularly the update section, I update information there. Uh, the, the, a lot of the stuff on the website is all out of date, so I need to work on including it so that uh, updating it is not so simple to do these updates anymore. Um, but uh, so that, that's one place you can get more information. Uh, the uh, information about the, about the scarves and uh, in, in the updates portion on my website, you'll see a, a section called updates. So that, that, that will have it. The other thing is look on my Instagram, uh, so please art, uh, that, that, that I post things, you can go back in time, and that, that has a lot of old stuff, and I have, I don't know, five, five, six hundred postings on Instagram, so you can go back there and take a look at 
some of the things that I've done and been involved with, particularly the more recent ones. It's easy to put things on Instagram and in the update section also, so that, that those are the places to look for, for more updated information. And uh, when are you planning to to do an exhibition in Brazil? Well, nobody's invited me. <laughs> if somebody invites me, who knows? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Maybe one day in the future. Well, uh, that would be interesting. I've never visited Brazil. And I have relatives of mine who live in Buenos Aires. So that uh, there would be a combined trip to Brazil and Argentina. So that would, that would be very interesting for sure. Oh, well, um, I believe that's it. Uh, Audrey, I would like to thank you to, for taking the time to speak with us. I would like to thank you. Uh, uh, you know, it's not the first time that we need to talk. Uh, we work together in a number of different projects, including the including the, the Hope and Spirit project, which we didn't mention here, but uh, the, video, the videos of Hope and Spirit uh, are translated and uh, are uploaded in the same channel that this podcast will be uploaded, so people who are watching this video can go later go on to watch the Hope and Spirit videos. But, um, I'll just, it was a pleasure to talk with you again. Um, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah, that's one thing we didn't discuss today, the entire Stalin uh, experience. That's an entire separate topic that, you know, I sort of grew up in that background, that history uh, in my childhood being in the uh, parents from the displaced from World War II who were able to escape Stalin's atrocities. And the knowledge of that was very, uh, was daily in my life growing up. And uh, it impacted me very, very much. And so that, it was what ten years ago that I devoted two years of my life to 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 commemorate the victims of Stalin's atrocities, and that was an entire project that I did and came. And as a matter of fact, that uh, one of the offshoots from the uh, that Hope and Spirit project, uh, a, a series of artwork, Siberia Souls, is actually what I'm working on with this composer in Lithuania. Uh, he wants to do the premiere. Um, a musical composition for the South African uh, music festival is going to be called Siberia Souls with my visual uh, elements that you can see on my website, uh, the, those images of people deported uh, to Siberia and then with them making a, a musical composition uh, related to that. So, so even, but that's still, even that is continuing in my artwork as a separate sort of a project. Anyway, so I, I'm glad you mentioned that I didn't want to and, and neglected, but we were talking about all these other aspects of, of things that, and, and some aspects of that uh, Stalin uh, uh, experience are, are still showing up in my artwork as, as active issues that, uh, as I say, a year from now, you'll be able to attend a conference in, in, in Johannesburg and listen to the music and, and, my, and, we, and, 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 and view my art. Yeah, and well, maybe one day in the future we could arrange a, another podcast to talk all about um the Hope and Spirit project and its Stalin's atrocities. But, um, Audrey, again, I would like to thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, so, um, in my name, in the name of Raffaele, we are uh, deeply grateful for you for taking time to speak with us. Uh, and please come back anytime soon. Thank you, Paulo, for all your interest. I really appreciate it. And particularly of getting this uh, uh, experience uh, of uh, post-war uh, experience with, with 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 the travesty of what happened in communist Russia and in the in the Soviet Union, uh, better known to the world, the Portuguese-speaking world. So I really want to uh, thank you so much for all the work that you've done um, uh, so selflessly in, in this area. Thank you. <laughs>